Democratic primary winner. This 90-minute debate took place last week in Juneau, Alaska. Good evening and welcome to By the People, Debate for the State 2006. I'm Christopher Clark. We are coming to you live from the KTO studios here in Juneau. Joining us tonight are the top three Republican candidates for governor. Governor Frank Murkowski, who was elected governor four years ago after serving 22 years in the U.S. Senate. Sarah Palin, who was mayor of Wasilla for six years. She also has served as president of the Alaska Conference of Mayors and as chair of the Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. And John Binkley, who served in the legislature for six years, two in the House, four in the Senate. He also was chairman of the Alaska Railroad Corporation's Board of Directors. He comes from a family of riverboat captains based in Fairbanks. Welcome to you all. Thank you. And joining me on tonight's panel of reporters are Michael Carey, representing the Anchorage Daily News and Dave Donaldson of the Alaska Public Radio Network. Later in the show, we will be joined by Fairbanks reporter Libby Casey of KUAC. Welcome to you all. And now a few ground rules. For our studio audience, thank you for showing tonight. We ask that you don't applaud or do anything else that may disrupt tonight's debate. And for the candidates, I will tell you how to respond to the questions and how long you will have to respond to them, which will vary from segment to segment. You will have one minute to answer a question and 30 seconds for a rebuttal or a response to a follow-up question from one of our reporters here. In the lightning rounds, you will have up to 30 seconds to respond. When you hear this bell go off, your time is done. To help pace yourself, there are three lights above this camera over here. Green means go, yellow means you have 10 seconds left, and red means stop. That said, primary voters go to the polls Tuesday in Alaska and Wyoming. On the ballot in Wyoming, the race for go One minute, sir. I think as, as a governor up for re-election, it's important to reflect on the accomplishments of my administration. We made some tough decisions. But what we have is a, a good financial position. We've been able to balance our budget for the last four years. We've developed a substantial surplus, which we put in education, which I consider an investment. We've had successes in providing the first veterans home in the state of Alaska. We were successful in providing for the University of Alaska Land Grant College to receive 250,000 acres of state land. The previous governor had vetoed that. We've been successful in the area of predator control. I'm the first governor that's really survived that battle. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to have the endorsement of the National Rifle Association. We've been able to increase education, I think, dramatically in this state and provide for accountability. But most of all, we've got a good start on this gas line, and that's what I'm committed to because that's going to anchor the economy, the state of Alaska, for the next 50 years, and that's why I'm committed to finish the job. Thank you, Governor. Ms. Palin. Thank you. I see Alaska on the cusp of great opportunity and great progress. And as a lifelong Alaskan, when I see state governments stray from the spirit of our Constitution, our state Constitution that mandates that all Alaskans, their needs be put first, then I'm compelled to respond. And my response is to offer myself up in the name of service to serve as governor, to change the attitude, to change the approach to dealing with our issues, to bring in more trust, to bring in transparency, to bring in um, new energy, new ideas, and put obsessive partisanship and um, negative actions, negative campaigns, put those aside because Alaskans deserve better. I'm very thankful for this opportunity tonight to debate because Alaska is so rich, rich in opportunity, rich in resources, natural and more importantly human resources, and we know tonight that all the challenges and opportunities we'll be debating Nothing um, will be um, debated without recognizing that we can tap into these wealth of resources and address all of our issues. So I'm thankful for this opportunity tonight. Thank you, Ms. Palin and Mr. Binkley. 
Good evening, fellow Alaskans. I'm John Binkley, and this evening I'm going to be asking for your support for the privilege of serving as your governor. And I want to first thank you for tuning in this evening, really, and participating in this democratic process. Without you, it wouldn't be possible, so thank you. And I hope that you're able to pay attention to the differences between the candidates this evening, not just some of the platitudes uh, or talk, but really the specifics about how we're going to move the state forward. It is an exciting time in Alaska's history. We have tremendous opportunity before us, but we have to do two things to reach that opportunity. Number one, reestablish trust in our government and in our leadership. It's fundamental to leadership to have the trust of the people you're leading. And number two, we need to make the right decisions to set the course for future generations. And to do that, we need a governor that has a depth of experience, understanding, knowledge, and maturity to lead the state forward. Thanks again for being here this evening. And thank you, Mr. Binkley. And now, on to the questions. Because oil and gas issues are front and center this year, we will start off by focusing on them, but I just want to assure our audience that later in the debate, we will bring up other topics. So let me start with Ms. Palin. Again, you'll have one minute to respond. But as you know, in the news, there has been the partial shutdown of the Prudhoe Bay oil fields because BP found leaks and, and corrosion there. Did the state drop the ball on this by placing too much trust into BP um, to inspect and maintain the lines? Ms. Palin. Well, obviously so, yes. It's deferred maintenance and negligence on the part of an oil company to have allowed this corrosion to essentially shut down one of Alaska's economic lifelines, and that's so unfortunate. And the state had better not pay for their deferred maintenance problems. So, yeah, we have our regulatory agencies, DOT, DEC, other agencies that I have faith in, I have trust that once the politics are taken out of those kind of agencies, that they'll do their job and get to the bottom of an investigation and, and find um, what it is that BP needs to do to repair. But in all those years, to never have successfully pigged the 16-mile stretch there of BP's line that shows the corrosion, that's, um, that's negligence on BP's part, and the state even needs to step up and do a better job of monitoring. Thank you, Ms. Palin. Governor, let me make it clear that if there are questions about whether the state dropped the ball, that it's obviously questions that go back to several governors, not just you. I didn't mean to imply that maybe you were the blame here. But in essence, did the state drop the ball on this? No, the state did not drop the ball. Traditionally, within the oil patch, so to speak, it's a function responsibility of the field operator and the companies to maintain a reasonable uh, maintenance uh, that protects their investment and protects the, uh, uh, the the cash flow associated with the oil. I mean, everybody is a loser when uh, a situation like this happens, and it's clear that uh, there were uh, pigs that went through that line. There were there were two over an extended period of time. Unfortunately, they just didn't show the the circumstances that occurred as a consequence of these very very large lines over a period of time. The oil it was the throughput was reduced to the point where it was not flushing and as a consequence they had something that they had no idea that was occurring that did occur and they should be held responsible and uh, under my administration uh, we're going to hold them responsible for the costs associated with repairing uh, those lines and uh, protecting their own interests as well as the interests of uh, citizens of Alaska. Thank you, Governor. And Mr. Brinkley, did we drop the ball and should we be doing more? I know the feds and others are asking whether we need to be doing more and that maybe we've just been too gullible and trusting and naive and believing that the oil companies can do this. Well, as an Alaskan, I'm outraged. We have dropped the ball. This administration has dropped the ball. The regulatory agencies that we have, whether it be DEC, the Oil and Gas Commission, DOT, uh, these agencies should be regulating, should be keeping an eye on those operators up on Prudhoe Bay, and they are liable. That operator, BP, it struck me as I watched that executive jet fly into Dead Horse, and I saw that plane and all their executives. I'm sure they didn't just inspect that the last time in 1992. I'm sure they keep their equipment that their executives travel in in top-notch shape. We as Alaskans should accept nothing lower than that for the equipment, for the facilities on the North Slope. It's critical not only to Alaska, but to our nation. And we have a responsibility to make certain that those operators are maintaining those facilities so that we can provide that energy to America so Alaska can get the, the benefit of that resource as well. Governor, I, I hear a potential rebuttal there. You'll have 30 mm -hmm. seconds if you want to rebut, and of course we'll go to Ms. Palin as well. Well, obviously it's not in the interest of the producers to have this uh, situation occur. 
And uh, as a consequence, this particular line was the line that was carrying the oil that was basically ready for the refinery process. It didn't have the water and so forth. They had been monitoring the line, uh, but they hadn't been using the pig. Uh, the incident occurred, and as a consequence, we're going to hold them responsible. But uh, to suggest that the state should get in the business of physically monitoring uh, by contracting with a carrier for the, uh, for the wherewithal, it's simply not done. And what we have an obligation to do is monitor the information we get, and we've done that. Thank you, Governor. Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. Well, I've had to clarify for the governor now, for Mr. Binkley, at least one of those regulatory agencies, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, I, I wish had um, I been serving on there, that we had the jurisdiction to regulate the above ground pipelines and any kind of corrosion problem. But uh, it's other uh, regulatory agencies that do have that responsibility. Again, I name those DOT, DEC, others, AOGCC. Uh, regulates the um, underground well casings, um, underground operations. And Mr. Binkley, we'll give you the last word on this. Well, thank you. I know when I was growing up, my grandfather always used to tell me, excuse is failure. And we can make all the excuses in the world, but the bottom line is those fields, those pipelines weren't maintained. The state has a role in oversight over those facilities, uh, whether they be underground facilities with AOGGC or above ground facilities with DOT or DEC. The state of Alaska has a responsibility and excuse, in my opinion, is failure. Thank you, Mr. Beakley. And on to the next question from Dave Donaldson. Governor, you've uh, actively supported, worked uh, exclusively with uh, the gas line route that uh, goes through Canada to the lower 48. There are two other options available, uh, the All-Alaska route to Valdez, the over-the-top route through the Beaufort Sea. Um, and then there are various other options of operators and so forth, that those are the three different tracks and land. Why, why do you choose the one that goes through Canada? Why is that the one that is, the, the, that is exclusive? Well, the Beaufort Sea route is not a consideration. It was at one time, but it was eliminated by the action taken by both the federal government as well as the state government. Uh, the, your reference to the All-Alaska route, as I understand it currently, is the Port Authority, which would propose to take the gas down to uh, Valdez, liquefy it, and then move it to uh, about two and a half days sailing down to the, a port of Kitimat in British Columbia. Then it would go across 410 miles of British Columbia to the ECO hub. Now, it could only carry one quarter of the volume of gas because of the limited pipeline from Kitimat to the ECO hub, while the volume of gas that's proposed by the producers would be over four times the amount. And it would go to the same location, and we would be able to monetize the reserve of gas, and it's hardly I think uh, accurate to refer to that as the All Alaska Line because it does go through 410 miles of British Columbia. And uh, one other thing I'd like to make uh, a point. We provide for uh, a Port Authority route or any other route in the, in, in the contract under f the FERC uh, open <coughs> access provision. So if they get a project, they, they can pursue that. Thank you, Governor. Um, Ms. Palin, would you like to respond to that? Or Dave, would you like to redirect the question? No, please, sir. Okay, certainly. You know, we are going to build a gas line. We'll build that on my watch. And we'll do that by working with the legislators and not against the legislators. And we will fairly consider all viable options, including an Alaskan route, whatever it takes to connect Alaskans with our gas, the North Slope gas that we own and that oil companies have been sitting on for quite some time. Economically, our gas isn't stranded anymore. We need to connect Alaskans, our homes, our businesses, our economy with our gas. While we're working with oil producers, as they're planning, considering whether or not to build a gas line someday through Canada, we need to connect Alaskans to our gas. Thank you. And Mr. Binkley, you have a minute to respond to Dave's question on the question of routes. Well, thank you. Clearly, the All-Alaska Highway route is the most economical route that produces the most return for the state of Alaska. And so that's the preferred route. That's my preferred route that we should be pursuing. Uh, certainly, the industry, the oil producers have the leases. They have the capability, the wherewithal to be able to build that line. They are the ones that we need to be working with primarily. But we have to be tough at the bargaining table. We have to stand up for Alaskans to make certain that Alaskans have access to that gas, that we actually get a gas line built in an agreement. So those would be baselines for me in negotiating as we go forward. We also need to, at the same time, not preclude other options, like a third party owning the line that would be built from Prudhoe Bay down to the Midwest. 
also the potential, if we can't get agreements with the producers, to build a bullet line, a line that would serve Alaska, a smaller line that we could build to produce gas for the south central area and <coughs> keep those economies going down there to heat Alaskan homes and businesses. Thank you, Mr. Beakley. Governor, you have a 30-second rebuttal to, obviously, a difference of agreement, a difference of, of opinion on how to uh, get well, a gas Well, let me just expand it a little bit more. As, as most of us know, there are four takeoff points in the contract. Uh, one of them is the Yukon River. Hopefully they can provide butane <coughs> downriver to the villages. The other one is in Fairbanks. The other one is in Delta. And uh, we're going to take uh, the 20% uh, the of the gas will be our gas. We'll take it in kind. We can direct it anywhere we want. And I, I, I'd like to point out something else that's uh, overlooked. This gas was acquired on competitive leases, and the producers hold these leases. They have the sanctity of a contractual commitment Thank you, to Governor. pursue that. So uh, that's important. Mr. Bakley, we'll give you 30 seconds to rebut. You bet. Uh, we need to get a gas line built. No delays, just tough negotiations for a fair deal <clears throat> for Alaskans to be able to participate in this line, for Alaskans to be able to get low-cost energy to heat their homes and their businesses, to be able to build facilities that we can actually create jobs off of here in Alaska with Alaska's gas. We can do it, we can do it quickly, and we can get Alaska's gas to market, and Alaskans can benefit from that resource. And Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. I think what's being overlooked, though, is that uh, markets are demanding our resources, and entities should be competing for the right to tap those resources. And as we negotiate, we need to have a couple of fundamentals in mind. I think we conceded too much and then called that a negotiation. Instead, we have to negotiate for gas to Alaskans first. Article 8 of our Constitution mandates that, that maximizing benefits for Alaskans should come first. We have to guarantee the jobs and industry are for Alaskans here. And then the petrochemical spin-off industry industries should be capitalized on here in Alaska. Not necessarily a foreign country, but for Alaskans, those spin-off industries. Thank you, Ms. Palin. And we now turn to Michael Carey for the next question. Okay, we'll start with Sarah Palin, please. Um, has BP's decision to close most of their North Slope production and questions about state oversight damaged the state's case for opening ANWR to oil development? You know, I think what has um, perhaps damaged the state's case, and we have to work even harder and be ever more vigilant in convincing those across the nation that for national security reasons, we do have to open ANWR. I think what has really hurt, though, is that the state of Alaska, we can't even get it together here and open up our own Point Thompson. Once Point Thompson gas is being able to be developed and brought onto the marketplace and the resources up there, we're going to have infrastructure up there, which is on the edge of ANWR. We'll be able to develop from there, and it will give less of a reason for those, especially on the East Coast, to tell us here in Alaska that ANWR will never be open. Develop Point Thompson, we're on the route to do that until the former Department of Natural Resources officials who had said it's time to develop Point Thompson until they lost their jobs. I'd like to bring those folks back and start working again on Point Thompson in order for the rest of the nation to understand that ANWR can be safely developed. Governor, you have a one-minute response to the issue yeah, of Michael, stewardship. Michael, that uh, section that's being shut down is the eastern section. It's roughly 200,000 barrels a day. It will be replaced with smaller flow lines, and then they may go to the western section. I don't know. The Point Thompson issue, of course, we can't have a gas line without developing Point Thompson. Point Thompson will be developed. I think it makes uh, a case uh, in, in the minds of Alaskans for ANWR because clearly uh, it's an area where we have the likelihood of a major discovery if indeed uh, you know Congress allows us to open it and with the price of, of oil up to seventy three dollars or thereabouts and the recognition that uh, you know we can open this area up safely it'll be interesting to see what Congress does when they go back unfortunately we now need sixty votes as opposed to a simple majority and uh, you know the environmental community fails to recognize uh, uh, unfortunately, the contribution that we can make and the fact that we can do it correctly because we have the technology and the American wherewithal to do it correctly. Mr. Binkley, how do we pitch Anwar in light of the uh, recent developments on the North Slope? Well, it certainly hasn't helped our case. Uh, we have to have the highest standards possible in the world for the development of our resources on the North Slope. That's the way we demonstrate to the rest of the United States and the rest of the world that we can do it right in Alaska. That's why it's so critical that we really give the tools to those agencies, DEC, DOT, the Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, all those agencies that have responsibilities on the North Slope, the tools that they need to have the proper oversight to make certain that the industry is maintaining those fields, that they do do it right. 
So that is key in, in going forward with ANWR, our responsibility of doing it right. Point Thompson is critical. It is in, in a lease that Exxon has had for 30 years. There are 300 to 500 million barrels of oil in that lease, as well as 8 trillion cubic feet of gas. We need to hold Exxon's feet to the fire to develop that oil now as they're required to under those leases. Dave, you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, for, uh, well, actually for, for all of you, if you, if you care to. We've been trying since, uh, I know in 1991 when I got here, we were trying to reopen Anwar, getting it through Congress uh, to, to get it done. So far, it is unsuccessful. It's still here. The strategy has not worked um, for various reasons. Is it time to try a new strategy? Is there a new strategy? How do you go about getting the message across? I, th I think, Dave, one of the most important things the governor can do, really, is to rally the country. And the governor should be out traveling to other governors, other capitals of the United States, to talk to governors, to let them know that we have the answer to America's energy needs. This is a rare opportunity that we have in time, an opportunity where the country's focus is on energy right now. The governor needs to capitalize on that. Go to the governors of other states, let them know that Alaska has the answer <coughs> to their energy needs. Then they will re be reverberating that message around the U.S. Thank and we'll you, get Mr. It Mr. Bakley and Ms. Palin. Yeah, Dave, uh, it is a form of insanity to keep repeating the same actions and expect a different result. So, yeah, it is time to shift gears. And I agree with Mr. Binkley that the governor can uh, play such an important role in this and letting Americans know about the volatility in world markets and energy markets and um, just the state of um, uh, human nature here on Earth right now, so volatile. All the more reason for national security reasons for ANWR to be open and we have to educate the rest of the nation and let them know how important this is and that Alaskans <coughs> can do this safely, environmentally safely and soundly. Thank you, Ms. Payland. Governor. Well, I've had a little experience in this area in the United States Senate pounding the pavement and uh, what it's become, it's become a partisan issue. You saw what uh, you know, former President Clinton did. He vetoed the bill in 1995. We would have had ANWR open at that time. Environmental community rallied around the Democratic base and we're still left with that reality today and it's driven by the environmental community that uses it as a soapbox for money raising and membership. And uh, you know, what we have to do is uh, recognize the necessity of what new technology can do. That's the story we've got to tell and we can, I think, eventually prevail, but it might take gasoline lines around the block to do it. Thank you, Governor. And for interest of time, we're probably going to go right into our next segment. We can talk about oil and gas all night till the cows come home. Yep. So thank you. Now for another topic, the campaign finance initiative. The governor's race is not the only thing on Tuesday's ballot. Voters will also weigh in on two initiatives, one of which is ballot measure one. Money is the mother's milk of politics especially political campaigns. Candidates need it to reach voters, have their messages heard, and convince folks to vote for them. They need money to pay for television ads. Vote Sarah Palin, governor. Phone calls. Hello, this is your governor, Frank Murkowski. I was calling to ask you about some... Yard signs, bumper stickers, pamphlets, brochures, and other stuff. All this just to send them here the Alaska State Capitol. Those who have the most money usually have the best chance to get their messages out and win. And that usually favors elected officials. They often have no trouble raising money because of the power of incumbency. One of them is Fairbanks Representative David Guttenberg, who helped get the campaign finance initiative onto the primary election ballot. He knows what it's like to run for office for the first time, and says he backed the measure to help people who don't enjoy the advantages he enjoys now. Incumbents have all the natural advantages to them. Besides being able to raise money, you've got name recognition and you've campaigned before, you've been sending out mailers to people, you've had constituent meetings. Uh, ballot number one levels the playing field to where the voters wanted it in the past. Ballot measure one cuts in half what you may give a candidate from $1,000 to $500. What you may give a political party from $10,000 to $5,000, and what a group may give a candidate from $2,000 to $1,000.
It also changes the limits on what a group may give a political party from $4,000 to $1,000. But that's not all. The initiative also redefines who is a professional lobbyist. It reduces the number of hours people may lobby in a month before they have to register as a lobbyist from 40 hours to 10 hours. Work the halls of the Capitol trying to twist lawmakers' arms for more than 10 hours a month and you're a professional lobbyist. Guttenberg says that number targets those who make a living from lobbying and will not affect those who are regular citizens. good lobbyist walks into my office and spends five minutes. He tells me what's going on, what the story is, what his answer is, and hope, hopes that I would consider what he said. That takes three minutes. If it takes five minutes, you're starting to look at him and go, you don't understand your own issue, do you? But critics like North Pole Representative John Coghill says this is too much. Coghill says ballot measure one does more harm to challengers than help, makes it harder for grassroots lobbying, and restricts freedom of speech. In short, he says it tips the balance in favor of incumbents, and he calls it the Incumbent Protection Act. We protect our freedom of speech very jealously in America. And dollars is how you turn your, uh, your, your workload, your time and effort into your message, and, uh, and whether it's a party or an individual. If an individual wants to give uh, $700 to uh, somebody they really believe in, that's their message. Why should you stop them? Coghill's main concern is a provision that requires disclosure of gifts worth more than 100 bucks but allows smaller donations to go unreported as now required by law. And it leaves room for funny business. For example, you could launder a lot of cash under there and say, well, they were uh, 100 donors of less than $100. Nobody knows who they were. Nobody knows where the money came from. And to me, if you want full disclosure, leave that in there. So which is it? Campaign finance reform or an abridgment of free speech? We now turn to the candidates for their take on this. Thanks to Kyle Hopkins' handy blog on the Anchorage Daily News website, I learned that Ms. Palin supports the initiative. Mr. Binkley and Governor Murkowski do not, or at the very least, have some reservations about it. So let's start with Ms. Palin. You have 30 seconds. Are you voting for ballot measure one? If so, why? I do support ballot measure one. It's not perfect, but um, anything that we can do to build trust back into state government is great. Uh, let people know who's um, paying, who's the financing campaigns, where those outside dollars are coming from and where they're going to. Let uh, Alaskan voters know if um, your candidacy is grassroots and that can be revealed through this type of measure or if you're hiring outside firms to tell Alaskans how to vote. Uh, my mm. campaign is grassroots so personally I certainly appreciate uh, the measures in here that uh, mm. let Alaskans know that. Mr. Binkley, 30 seconds. There needs to be trust and transparency in government and this just does just the opposite. It really takes away some of that transparency. That's one of the reasons that I'm opposing it. We need to also allow our citizens that want to come down and and talk to their legislators not to have to go through the onerous uh, paperwork, 16 different reports that they'll have to file over the course of two years if they spend over 10 hours in a month. If they come down for one trip, spend two days working, talking to their legislators, they're going to be considered a professional lobbyist. It's wrong. And the governor? I'm opposed to it. The answer is very, very clear. Let's have full disclosure, total full disclosure of where the money comes from, all right, regardless of the amount. And then the public can make a determination of whether they think that the candidate has accepted appropriately the funds. And uh, if uh, he, uh, he or she has rejected the funds, they can see that. As you know, we have a, a, a quagmire here of discussions every few years on campaign of, uh, reform. But full disclosure is the answer. What's wrong with that? Thank you, Governor. The other item on Tuesday's ballot is the cruise ship initiative, a measure that would impose a $50 head tax on cruise ship passengers. Like the governor's race, it's generating a lot of heat. And a lot of money. It is layers and layers of unnecessary bureaucracy that will hurt Alaskans. It's a fairly straightforward three-part message, which is revenue, consumer protection, and protecting our waters. It is ballot measure two, and it will levy a $50 tax on these people, cruise ship passengers. 
More than 900,000 are expected to visit Alaska when the summer ends. At 50 bucks a head, the state would rake in more than $45 million a year. That money could be used to help fix up docks, harbors, streets, and other things tourists use, according to Joe Geldof, an initiative sponsor. It is designed to be levied and collected by the cruise ship companies and then placed into the general fund and spent on infrastructure in ports and non-ports. It also slaps a 33% tax on gambling that occurs on cruise ships when they're in Alaska. And it takes away a tax break the legislature gave them years ago by reinstating a state corporate income tax. All this does is bring back the status quo on the cruise ship industry that existed in 98 and makes them pay, you know, corporate income tax on their operations here just like Exxon is required to do, just like British Petroleum and any other industry is required to do. Ballot Measure 2 also sets up stricter environmental rules in response to past felony transgressions by a couple of companies that paid fines for dumping sewage and oily sludge into Alaska waters. It would require each ship to carry an ocean ranger, a state observer charged with making sure the rules are being followed. And it would mandate that each ship get a new kind of permit for discharging sewage and wastewater. Geldof says Alaska law does not go far enough now to regulate this. Compared to oil and gas, compared to mining, compared to seafood processing, um, virtually any other industry which is required to get a permit and adhere to all of the Alaska water quality standards, this industry um, gets by with half measures. But critics say this isn't needed. Drew Green, a Juneau resident who works in the tourism industry, says Alaska has one of the best environmental standards for cruise ships in the world. Nations and states are copying these standards. We are the pioneers, and we've developed technologies that did not even exist before to meet these high standards. The high level of standards that are met uh, have uh, effluent near shore uh, discharges that are shellfish quality water. The standards are much higher than what the EPA permits for local municipalities. And Green worries about the toll new taxes will take on the billion dollar a year industry and the Alaska economy. He points to a study that says that a 1% drop in the number of tourists coming to Alaska each year will result in an economic loss of $20 million and 250 jobs. Now, research has also shown that if this measure passes, that 10% that of people considering coming to Alaska will not come. Now that's very disturbing news considering what just 1% will, will uh, cause an, a negative economic impact in our state. And this pain, he says, would be felt throughout the state, not just in towns where cruise ships stop. Many travelers, after they finish the cruise, they travel on shore-based tours up to Denali, Fairbanks, the interior, and a large percentage of, of tourists to Alaska on cruise ships continue or extend their stay in Alaska on land-based tours via the railroad, by coaches, and so it affects them directly. Initiative sponsor Joe Geldof disputes this, saying the $50 head tax is less than what other ports charge outside of Alaska. And he says most people he's spoken to say it would not stop them from coming to the state. You ask them, would you be willing to pay $50? And, and they just sort of laugh because they're paying $1,500 to $3,000 to come here. And, you know, most of them say, why pay more, you know, tax on, on a rent-a-car when I, when I go to O'Hare or, you know, SeaTac or something. So which is it? Reform of the cruise ship industry or a huge hit to the economy? Mr. Binkley will now turn to you and um, ask what you think, yes or no, why? Every industry needs to pay their fair share and pay their way in Alaska to support the infrastructure and the facilities that they use. But on balance, this goes too far. Not only is the $50 onerous, but a lot of the, the nine pages of this provision really are onerous on small businesses, and that's really my concern. I would rather see that $50 be spent in local small businesses than $50 that goes to state government and, and the state treasury. So uh, we should all pay our fair, fair share, including the cruise industry. This just goes too far. Thank you, Mr. Bickley. 30 seconds. 
How about as governor, I do the will of the people on this, the voters will decide this. And um, as your package had just exemplified, it's so easy to see both sides of this. Presently, it's local property taxpayers, for the most part, uh, building up that infrastructure and improving the infrastructure that the one million tourists whom we welcome to Alaska, whom uh, they utilize that mm -hmm. infrastructure. And I'd like to see local property tax relief. However, as Mr. Binkley had pointed out, and I'm sure Governor Murkowski will point out, some of the um, burdensome regulatory uh, measures on this, um, they give me heartburn. So um, privately, personally, how I'll vote on this, thankful I have a few days still to decide. Okay, Governor Murkowski. I've decided it's a poor piece of legislation. It's poorly thought out. It would have a significant impact in Juneau and Ketchikan where there already is a head tax, uh, $5, $6, $4. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea that uh, you know the cruise industry is lax on uh, environmental standards is, is is simply not the case. I got the fed federal law through that tightened up uh, water quality discharge, and it's now a model legislation been adopted by the state of Washington. So we've got to remember that this industry can move out if we're not competitive. Thank you, Governor. Now we'll kick it up a notch for our lightning round. We have a series of questions that require prompt replies. You will have 30 seconds to respond, starting with Michael Carey. Okay, I'll start with Governor Murkowski since he is the governor. Governor, Wall Street Journal recently published an editorial highly critical of Alaska. Perhaps you saw it. I did. It said, Alaska, you have $30 billion in the bank and you keep asking the taxpayers of New Jersey and New York for more money. Essentially, the journal said, why don't you get off your butt and spend your own money? Um, if you were going to write a letter to the Wall Street Journal and tell them how they went wrong, what would you say? 30 seconds. Well, I'd start out and remind them that uh, we're the new kid on the block. Uh, you know, uh, We're still trying to develop uh, our resource base. Other states did it you know, 100, 150 years ago. And we got a lot of catching up to do. We don't have roads across our state. Other states do. We don't have the resource base that other states do with a, with a large population that's already developed. I'd say, come on up and I'll, I'll give you a round. We'll go up to Prudhoe Bay and we'll go up to the Dead Horse and we'll go out to Hooper Bay and see the real Alaska. And I'd hope they'd come. Thank you. Mr. Binkley. Yeah, I would say uh, let us open up our resources. Let us help the country. Let's develop ANWR. Let's bring that energy to America. Let's take some of the land that the federal government owns and give to Alaskans so we can develop those resources so that we can pay our own way. That's all we're asking for as Alaskans. I think that there were promises made at statehood uh, that have not been met by the federal government. And as soon as they meet those, we'd be happy to, to meet you halfway. Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. Yeah, I'd remind these folks, remember when Alaska became a state, we went to the feds and we said, let us come into the union and we'll be as self-sufficient as possible. And the feds said, sure, come on in, Alaska, you'll become a state and you will be as self-sufficient as possible. <coughs> and you do that by developing your God-given, commonly owned resources up there. So they have to let us do that because we have obligations via our Statehood Compact Act and via our Constitution to develop our resource resources so that we can be more self-sustaining. And we're going to have to be there as federal dollars quit pouring in as generously as maybe they have in the past. Okay, we're going to be tight on this one. Dave, your question. To follow up in a way on that, but also another question entirely, the state's now set up to get a 50 per 50 share of the uh, development of the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska when, uh, whenever it, uh, it, it actually gets to major production. However, that's less than the 90-10 split that, that uh, was promised under the State Hood Compact. Um, what do you challenge this federal take? Is there something uh, about that, Mr. Binkley? And 20 seconds, I'm afraid. Uh, I certainly would. It was, uh, it was in our State Hood Compact Act, the 90-10. We need to fight for it. Uh, we need to be vigilant always in that and always pursue that. We shouldn't allow the federal government to overstep their bounds beyond the agreements that we made at statehood. Ms. Palin. Absolutely. We need to put Alaskans first. Um, the feds have obligations to us there, that 90-10 split. It's just unfortunate that it's been um, allowed to slide. We have legal uh, means and we have different avenues that we can travel in order to ensure that 90-10. We have to pursue that. Governor. We made a mistake some time ago when we accepted a 90-10 on a very, very early lease sale uh, adjacent to NPRA. And once we accepted that, why we weakened our case. But I feel very strongly that there is a case. But uh, that was a real blow, and hindsight's uh, pretty cheap on these issues now. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, candidates. Now for a breather. It's time for us to allow stations to identify themselves. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. And welcome back. Joining us now is Fairbanks reporter Libby Casey of KUAC. Welcome, Libby. 
This afternoon, Murkowski campaign workers held a press conference to, quote, discuss sensitive public records of both Sarah Palin and John Binkley, unquote. They played ads taking Mr. Binkley to task for supporting Democrat Tony Knowles for governor in 1998 and Miss Palin to the woodshed for sending emails and making phone calls that related to a political campaign from her mayor's office in Wasilla. All this while the two were on a plane to come to Juno for this debate. Just a reminder, there will be a segment later in the show to allow candidates to ask each other questions, including this particular talk. But I just wanted to give Mr. Binkley and Ms. Palin a chance to respond to these charges now. Mr. Binkley, starting with you, you have one minute. Well, thank you. Uh, I certainly uh, did contribute to Tony Knowles' campaign in 1998. Uh, I also contributed to and supported Governor Murkowski in 2002. I find no trouble running against an individual who I have uh, given financial support to prior. Uh, I certainly anticipate a, a victory on Tuesday against uh, Governor uh, Murkowski, who I supported, and I anticipate a victory against uh, Governor Knowles November 7th. Ms. Palin. One minute. Now, I think uh, last minute smear campaigns, they kind of remind me of my days as a basketball player at Wasilla High. We were state champs back there, and I'll never forget in our state championship game, fouls at the end of the ball game that started coming. The fouls were committed just to stop the clock. Kind of reminds me of what's going on here, but in our case in this race, the clock's not stopping. So as we move forward in kind of the old negative campaign politics as usual at the end times there, they rear their head. and kind of one of the reasons that good people want to stay out of politics because they know what's coming and that is politics as usual people are tired of that Alaskans are asking for positive change in government and in campaigns that's why I'm going to keep on taking the high road and only run a positive campaign Governor Murkowski well uh, as far as uh, Sarah Palin's comments uh, you know she was very critical of Randy Rudrick uh, Randy was using his office for inappropriate campaign activities and uh, I think she and the media uh, took him to task, and it was appropriate. I did ask for his resignation, and he resigned. But I see very little difference, Sarah, in what uh, you sent out of your office and the uh, information that uh, has been made public relative to using your telephones, your staff for directive activities, and we have, uh, we have uh, indications uh, that are, f are uh, evaluated by your own personnel and I would uh, respectfully uh, hope that the media would recognize that uh, you know these kind of charges uh, have to go both ways. And if you make them on one, uh, why you have to expect uh, 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 an evaluation of your own activities. And I think the people uh, of your community uh, should, uh, in themselves, satisfy themselves whether what you were doing was appropriate. Thank you, Governor. I think and this merits a 30-second rebuttal. Sir, Randy Redrick was fined the highest ethics violation in state's history because he leaked confidential attorney-client privilege information to gas companies that we were regulating mm -hmm. at AOGCC. Then he turned around and received campaign contributions for that. That was the egregious act and the illegal acts there. And that information was brought forth to you, Governor Murkowski, and uh, the conflict of interest there went on too long. As for my own activities, Governor Murkowski, I was surprised today that in that packet that you released, mm -hmm. it had a lot of, I don't know if you read the packet, but it mm -hmm. had a lot of confidential personal information in there, like my social security number and bank account numbers, and you released it anyway. Well, uh, that was a matter that was released by people in your organization uh, that provided Governor, this information for us. So we can uh, ask some other questions. Yeah. If you folks like, you can bring this up sure. later when we have the candidates exchange. I'll, I'll turn to Libby, who has a question for the candidates. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Ms. Palin, you said that abortion should only be allowed to save the life of the mother. That means abortion should not be allowed in cases of rape or incest. How would you justify your stand to an 18 year old teen who is a rape victim? Yeah, you know, I know that um, it's, it's very sensitive, it's, it's very personal, these decisions. I'm on record as stating that I am pro-life. I want women to understand that they're strong enough and powerful enough um, to never be led to believe that they have to abort in order to pursue education or pursue career. There are other alternatives out there like adoption. And, um, you know, I do see both sides of this issue, but I am um, ardently pro-life and understanding that there is sanctity and great potential in every human life. Mr. Binkley, you have a minute. Well, I am pro-life as well and, and have been. It is a difficult decision to, to come to. You come to it through your consciousness, uh, through your introspection, and, and that's the, the way that I've come to my belief in the issue. I do believe in the sanctity of life uh, from conception until natural death. 
And there are options out there, and we need to make certain that people are educated in those options. And Governor Murkowski, one minute. Well, I've always been pro-life, and uh, you know there are certain uh, circumstances where, <clears throat> with the life of the mother, of rape, incest, uh, but uh, beyond those considerations, uh, I would uh, would not allow uh, or approve of abortion, and um, continue, and have always maintained that position. A 30-second follow-up for each of you, and again, I'll start with Ms. Palin. In a recent survey, you said that you would support abstinence until marriage education, but that you would not support explicit sex ed programs. What are explicit sex ed programs, and, and does that include talking about condoms in school? No, I don't think that, that it includes something that, that relatively benign. I explicit means explicit. No, I'm pro-contraception, and I think kids who may not hear about it at um, home should hear about it in other avenues, so I'm not anti-contraception, but um, yeah. Yeah, abstinence is, is another alternative that should be discussed with kids. I don't have a problem with that. That doesn't scare me, so um, it's something that I would support also. Mr. Binkley, things like condoms, are those things that we should talk about in high schools? I think it, it's appropriate to talk about contraception, but I think it's also equally important to talk about abstinence. I think that should be the preferred choice is abstinence and something that we should set as a standard, hopefully. And when I mentioned options before, the options that I'm referring to were adoptions, uh, when, I, when I speak about options uh, of education. And Governor, 30 seconds. Well, obviously, we have to educate our children, and you have to educate them, just not on <coughs> the associated um, uh, you know, preventive uh, uh, activities, but from the standpoint of human health. And uh, as a consequence, uh, I'm not satisfied that we do a very good job in communicating an image to young people. Uh, promiscuity is uh, pretty prevalent on the, uh, in the media. And I think we have to balance that with uh, a recognition of the consequences associated with wrong decisions. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a tough set of facts, but it has to be done. And Thank we you, have Governor. to do a better job of it. And Michael, we're, we're going to turn to you for the next Okay, this is uh, continuing on the social questions, and I have a question about marijuana. Governor has, uh, government has been putting people in jail for 75 years for smoking marijuana, yet people don't stop. Isn't it obvious by now that the war, war against marijuana is failing? Mm. They could put the whole country in jail, and the people who still like to smoke marijuana would smoke it in jail. John Binkley. Well, of course, we've been putting people in jail for many offenses for 75 years, and they still don't stop many of those offenses. So I don't think that's the, the issue. I think it is a health problem for, uh, for young people particularly, and I think that the state needs to set aside to the high standard. And I think that's appropriate. I uh, agreed with the changes that were made in terms of the laws earlier this year and would stand by those. Ms. Palin. Uh, you know, I don't condone smoking pot. I don't uh, want kids to think that it's okay to do. Um, meth is a much, much greater problem, though, and uh, I think that should be such a concern of our legislature, of our law enforcement agencies, and um, prioritizing there for cracking down on meth, the meth heads, the meth labs, getting that out of our communities because it's destroying some of our communities. That's where the problem lies also. Again, saying that without any um, intimation there that I condone marijuana either. Governor Murkowski, 30 seconds. My concern is with, with the children and the example <clears throat> that is set in a household where the parents are smoking marijuana. Sure, the privacy issue is the privacy issue, but the potency is higher. And, uh, you know, these children are raised in that kind of an environment, and they accept that as, as, as a norm. And, uh, you know, uh, they just don't have the judgment capability that an adult does, and as a consequence, uh, the decisions they make can be uh, the wrong decisions. We saw a murder in Anchorage where the, the, the boy put his mother in the freezer after murdering her, and that was over marijuana, high potency marijuana. Well, thank you. I have a quick question then, 30 second answer. Alaska doesn't have a death penalty, should it, Governor? No, I'm not ready to go the death penalty, but uh, it's a tough set of facts when you see we had another murder in Anchorage today at three o'clock. Uh, the ramifications of whether that was gang associated or not, I don't know, but it's getting to the point where that material witness bill that we finally got signed tonight because of some mix-ups. Uh, we, we can go and get witnesses now to provide the information that will help the law enforcement agency because they need all the help they can get. Mr. Binkley, 30 seconds. Death penalty? Well, as I stated earlier, I believe in the sanctity of life from conception until natural death, and so I'm opposed to the death penalty. I certainly believe in strong punishment 
for crimes, certainly uh, uh, heinous crimes, a life imprisonment with no parole. Uh, we need to send a strong message. Uh, and as uh, the governor pointed out, we have a difficult time with crime right now in Alaska. We have to get tough on crime. Crime is being tough on Alaskans, and we need to put the resources into the prosecution to make certain that our criminal justice system is well served. And Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. If our lawmakers were to consider such a thing, I think the support should be given for um, a, a heinous crimes, a murder of a child. I say, my goodness, hang them up. Yeah, a murder of a child, anything um, to such a degree, I don't think that there can be anything worse. And um, if lawmakers were to consider, that should be the consideration. Very well, on to the next question with Libby Casey. Well, sometimes children kill children. And this spring, half a dozen seventh grade boys at North Pole Middle School were arrested for plotting to bring guns and knives in to kill or attack their classmates and teachers. And of course, Bethel survived a school shooting there in 1997. Is it within the governor's power to make schools safer, sometimes from the children themselves? And I'll start with the governor. Yes, I think it is. And, and, and uh, the problem we have is a lot of the violence is constantly around our children. You see it on the t television programs, the Nintendo games, and it's, it's almost a fixation that become part of, of, of you know, their exposure and growing up. And, uh, you know, uh, at that young age, uh, you know, the, 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 they have an imagination and, and they don't realize when they cross over to a, a serious threat on life uh, because they're too immature to do that. We have to protect those children by having, I think, closer parental supervision on what those children do, and uh, as well as in the educational exposure when they're in school and when they're in church and so forth. We have to watch and guide and set an example for our children. And uh, uh, you know, uh, the counseling after this is something I was involved in with the principals up there, and uh, it was a tough set of circumstances because these kids went from make-believe to reality. Thank you, Governor. Ms. Palin, one minute. Yes, the governor can certainly affect such an atmosphere. Um, it's a matter of setting priorities. You know, we have very few constitutionally mandated services that we have to provide here via state government. It's public safety, it's education, and it's basic infrastructure. So we do those things right. We have to do them right. We have to fund them fully. Um, public safety certainly is um, top of my priority list. We have to set a tone, create the atmosphere, the atmosphere of zero tolerance, the atmosphere also of holding people accountable, holding families accountable when they're not paying attention to what their kids are up to, when they're not paying attention to the disruptive behavior in a classroom. And we have to also give more power back to these teachers to allow them to use um, the tools that they have legally at their disposal in order to um, uh, create a better atmosphere within the classroom so there isn't the disruptive um, as we have seen even there in North Pole. And Mr. Binkley, one minute. Well, certainly parental involvement is key, really, in not only the success of education, but in setting the right example for, for kids in school. Uh, and, and so that's something that we need to encourage throughout education. However, we can encourage parents to get involved with the education of their children, uh, with the lives of their children. We also have to provide good alter alternatives for, for youth growing up. Sports is a wonderful mechanism. I know living out in rural Alaska, how important just having a gym so that young people can play basketball in the gym. It really becomes the center of their life, the center of the community. And, and sports can be a great alternative to a lot of youth violence. And so we should encourage that and, and make certain that they've got healthy activities that they can do that are alternatives to violence. Thank you, Mr. Binkley. And on to Michael Carey with another question. Okay, here's a hardy perennial that comes up in every governor's term in some form. Uh, do you f oppose, favor or oppose the capital move? And we'll start with John Binkley. Well, the, the voters, of course, have spoken clearly on this issue that Juneau is the capital city. Uh, I've always supported Juneau being the capital city and will continue to, uh, to support that. It's important uh, that we recognize all areas of the state of Alaska. We seem to, to see over the years a concentration, really, of population and economic activity in, in certain sections of the state. And we are a great state because we are a diverse state. And there are different regions of Alaska, and we should recognize that and support those other regions. For that reason, I think the capital and the legislature should stay right here in the capital city of Juneau. Ms. Palin. 
I say, you know, keep the star on the map um, in, in due deference to our, our uh, constitutional founders and, and those who created Juneau as our state capital. Let it remain. I don't think that we should be afraid of, though, of um, opening up more government in terms of allowing our lawmakers, which already have within their purview, um, the ability to meet at least periodically for legislative hearings, for some special sessions, um, where more people can access them. But keep the star on the map. Keep the uh, capital there in Juneau. And Governor Burkowski. I think we have other and more important priorities to address than moving the capital, and I oppose it. Uh, however, I've taken another step by supporting a road, and there's a little difference of opinion here in Juneau whether a road should be a road out of Juneau or a road into Juneau. So if I have half the Juneauites uh, in support of it, well, I'll settle for that. On to another question from Libby. There's so many follow-ups we can do here, but I think there are other issues we want to cover, so on to Libby. Fixed costs are soaring for the university and K-12 schools because of retirement payments and rising fuel expenses. Using the university as an example, how important is it for the state to go beyond helping with those costs to actually funding developing programs and getting education up to, to be top-notch, programs like engineering and nursing that could provide jobs? And 30 seconds. You may want to kill me, but 30 seconds. It's critical. I just had an opportunity recently to have, uh, have the head of the university uh, President Hamilton give us, me a briefing on the university and several other le legislators that were there. Exciting things. The next 1,000 days are critical to the future of the University of Alaska. We need to make certain the resources are there so they can expand those programs, so they can expand the research dollars that really will make the university a first-class system. No state is a great state without a great university system. I'm committed to that. And Governor Murkowski. Well, the university is the engine um, that basically fires up the state and I've done something about it. I provided uh, the legislation that got passed 250,000 acres for our land-grant college to have some land so that it could generate some revenue from that land like the University of Washington does down in the downtown Seattle core area. And uh, as a consequence, I have been able to increase the budget 5% as a commitment each year. This last year it was 17%. And it's appropriate that we do so because this is an investment in the greatest renewable resource we have, our kids. And briefly, Ms. Palin. Um, adequate funding is necessary. So, though, is holding schools accountable for results and something that you had intimated a bit in there um, in terms of costs that aren't within our controls, PERS and TERS. We have to fix PERS and TERS. We should have taken part of that $1.6 billion surplus and started chipping away at that state pension plan because a pension is a promise and we need to start funding that shaky pension plan or it's going to be made manifest to the tune of about $9 billion a debt to the state of Alaska here if we don't fix it now. Thank you. And now for something completely different. Our friends at KYUK in Bethel asked folks in western Alaska to come up with a few questions for the candidates. They took their camera to the streets, homes, and offices. Let's listen. My name is uh, John Angayak. I'm orig originally from Tununik, Alaska, now living in Bethel. My question is, uh, Will you commit as governor to uh, reinstating the longevity bonus benefit for the elders? Thank you. And Governor, in case you didn't hear, he just wants to know about reinstating the longevity bonus. No, I, I would seconds. not. Uh, what it does, it sets up two classes of citizens, uh, those that would, would, would receive it previously as it was set up because it was provided $250 for those that were in the program prior to 1998. After 1998, there was nothing for anyone, whether they needed it or not. We should have a means-tested program, and we are providing that now for those that need it. So to go back and set up a system that just establishes a preference for one class of citizens is not in the interest of all Alaskans, particularly those that need it. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Binkley, 30 seconds. Yes, I support it, uh, worked on it over the years, and I would reinstate it. It's important. It's an important not only to the livelihood of so many Alaskans, particularly in rural Alaska, who really depend on that source of income. The elders who have given so much to our state, the pioneers who gave so much to our state. And it really is, in some small measure, a recognition of that contribution for us to let them know that we care about them, that they are important to our state. We want them to stay here and be an active of our state. And Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. Yes, our precious, precious elders, those who were enrolled in that program, the longevity program, and then prematurely lopped off. You know, the program, remember, it was 
it was already orchestrated to phase out. That was after much public debate, and we had decided that it would be phased out. For, so for those who were prematurely lopped off, you know, I am so sorry that that has happened to you, and we would reinstate for those still enrolled, still there, still deserving of the respect that can be made manifest through that longevity bonus. Thank you, and now we'll go on to the second question from rural Alaska. Give a listen. My name is Myron Nanning Sr., and I'm originally from Hooper Bay. I live here in Bethel, and I've lived here for over 20 years. My question to the, to the candidates is regarding revenue sharing. Will you re reinstate revenue sharing? And if you do, would you support it to give it equally to all communities, regardless of municipal status? Because right now, as it is proposed, it excludes villages that are not incorporated as municipalities. Ms. Palin, we'll turn to you first 30 seconds, restore revenue sharing and regardless of municipal Absolutely. status. Absolutely, we're going to restore municipal revenue sharing where we can trickle down the state's wealth finally back into the communities who can prioritize best for their community needs. It also will reduce local property taxes and chip away at recent state government overgrowth as a former mayor and manager of the fastest growing area of the state and as the former president of Alaska Conference of Mayors. I know from my municipal experience how important it is that the state's wealth be trickled down to the most responsible and respectful and responsive level of government and that's government closest to the people they deserve the state's wealth. Governor Murkowski, 30 seconds, you cut municipal revenue sharing, is it time to reinstate it? What we did last year is we increased revenue sharing to about $64 million. When we cut it off, it was $29 million. Uh, when I came in as governor, I was looking at an $800 million deficit, all right? You have to make some tough cuts. The interesting thing is that the legislature didn't see fit to override my veto on either that or the longevity bonus. So an awful lot of legislators ought to be stand up and be counted when it comes to the actual mandate of how you vote. They didn't override the veto, so they must have agreed with me. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Binkley, 30 seconds. I know how important municipal assistance and revenue sharing is. I served on the city council out in Bethel, small rural community. Also represented 74 different small communities when I was served in the state senate. I know firsthand how important that is. I fought for it when I was a legislator. I'll fight for it as governor. I'll make it a priority of mine to make certain that that's reinstated in larger communities to keep the property taxes down, in smaller communities just to keep the lights on in their small governments. Moving along, I'm afraid. One more question from rural Alaska. Let's give a listen. Hello, my name is Willie Keppel. I live in Bethel, Alaska. The question I'd like answered is, when is the legislature going to address the amount of taxation and royalties from mined resources? The mining companies are paying 7%. The people aren't getting their fair share according to the Alaska Constitution. When are we going to address this just like we are the oil revenues right now? So, Mr. Binkley, 30 seconds is the time to give the mining industry similar breaks that the oil industry may be getting. Well, as I stated before, every industry needs to pay its way. The mining industry is really the, the basis of Alaska. It's the way we got started here in Alaska. I know in Fairbanks it's a huge part of our economy. Produces over One mine produces over 400 jobs. They make tremendous contributions to our, our economy. We shouldn't look at everything just in terms of how much revenue it produces for government how much it produces in the economy of a local area. Mining does a fabulous job. I want to do everything I can to increase the number of jobs from the mining industry. Thank you. Governor Murkowski. We have to have a balance and we have to recognize that you know, we live in a competitive world here and our mines and our minerals only are developed if the economics are favorable. It takes a tremendous investment to develop the resources of Alaska. We have to market these minerals outside Alaska. So we have to remain competitive in relationship to the government take. And I think we're about right as far as mining is concerned. And mining is different than oil and gas. And, uh, you know, for a long time we had a dry spell in, in, in mineral development. And I don't think the way to develop it is to increase the tax on it. I think uh, we should get the job base expanded as we're doing. Thank you. And Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. 
Well, all industries must contribute. These, these gentlemen are correct. Um, and mining isn't oil and gas here. When we're dealing with Exxon and British Petroleum, these multinational global mega corporations who are taking as much from Alaska and leaving as little behind, you know, I guess more power to them. That's capitalism. They're doing what they're tasked to do by their shareholders. But the state CEO, the governor, needs to be on the other side of negotiating tables when we're dealing with those resource developers and say, look, Alaska's Constitution, Article 8, mandates that Alaska's needs need to be put first. That includes mining, but especially oil and gas. Thank you, Ms. Palin. And now it's time for another lightning round. You will have 30 seconds to respond to the questions, and I'm going to use my chair here to ask the first one and just give you 15 seconds to wow. respond. Whom do you want as your running mate, uh, Sean Parnell or Jerry Ward, Governor Murkowski? Uh, I'll take Sean. Why? Well, he's an experienced uh, uh, and I think a, a balanced uh, uh, person in his views. He's, uh, he's uh, well educated. He's got a broad experience uh, as a lawyer and uh, I think fits in more in the mold that, uh, of, a, of a lieutenant governor that it's can Sorry to keep a tie on you. Miss Bailey. That's all right. Sean Farnell or Jerry Ward? Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, never underestimate the will of the people and the people will decide who my running mate will be and I'll be happy to serve with either. And Mr. Binkley. It certainly is uh, up to the people. We have a system that uh, elects the governor and the running mate, the lieutenant governor, separately. It's up to the electorate, and we'll stand by whoever they choose to be uh, running mate, and hopefully it's my running mate. And, they can, and now that I've had my mischief, let's go on to Michael Carey. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this may seem like the when did you stop beating your wife or husband question, but I wanted to ask, um, you've all been in public life for a while now. Is there one decision, one vote, one position that you've taken over this period of time that you regret and would like to have over if you had the opportunity? And whom would you like to answer first? Uh, the governor's got the longest experience, so we'll start with Governor Murkowski. Well, in, 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 as governor of the state, I, I think where we really had a great opportunity that failed is on the POMV, where we were trying to establish, you know, just how to take a portion of the value and fund the dividend, which would have been more than we had previously, uh, about $1,000. We were going to fund uh, uh, education 45% and local government 5% with a solid renewable basis. It passed the House. It failed in the Senate. It was a great opportunity. We'll be back to it one day. There's no question about it because we simply have to. Sarah Palin. Well, in my 11 years in public service and elected office, what I've learned is that when the voters mandate change, when they vote you in there, expecting you to fulfill the obligations, the promises that you made, and you have people around you who may not uh, uh, want to jump on the train with you and um, let you fulfill those mandates, then it's tough to work with those people. So I think one decision that I had made in trying to win somebody over and kept them on too long on my staff um, created some harm, but I learned some good lessons there. Again, when the voters mandate change, you got to have people around you also who agree with the vision and, and not having a bunch of yes men around you, but people who will um, help you fulfill what you have obligated yourself to to the voters. Mr. Binkley. One of the differences that I found coming into the political scene, of course, I've been in business all of my life and I served six years, but really the difference, uh, of course, a lot of business principles that I like to bring to my position in the, in the legislature, but there, there was a difference, a fundamental difference, and I call it the political law of physics, that any money that's available for appropriation will be appropriated. So it's, it's always a good lesson for me to take the money off the table, put it in the savings, because we know as oil prices go up, they're going to go down just as quickly. So that's uh, one of the, the decisions and uh, the lessons that I learned. Get the money off the table and save it for the rainy day. That'd be Casey, you're next with the next round of questions. Thanks, Chris. In the past few years, more than 30 men and women with ties to Alaska have died serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. As governor, you have the opportunity to speak with the families. Uh, Mr. Binkley and Ms. Palin, beyond thanking them for their service, what would you say to them? We'll start with you, Mr. Binkley. Well, it, it is. It's, uh, and I had the opportunity to meet with some families at Elmendorf uh, here a while back that had lost a son. Uh, a family from North Pole and, and a couple of families from Anchorage. And it is one of the most difficult and heart-wrenching um, uh, things to go through, really, to try and comfort a family. Uh, but the sense that I got in listening to those families, it really was a lesson that I learned in how strong they were in the knowledge that their uh, children who were uh, soldiers that were killed in war, how they had 
a good solid knowledge about what they were doing and the the fact that they felt as though they were committed to do the right thing and that they felt good about the sacrifices uh, that their children had made in the war. So it's, it's a difficult one. You can comfort them, uh, let them know that we do appreciate their service, that what they have done is valuable for the country and for democracy around the world. Ms. Palin. But I would thank them um, so profusely. First and, and foremost, thank them for their service. and. Um, you know, for me, my 17-year-old son, who's showing a lot of interest in serving his country, exploring different options there with military, I'm starting to live this and um, starting to really have it touch my heart and understand more about um, what families go through as their kids decide to make these decisions. And um, I would thank them. I say God bless them and let them know how profoundly appreciative the rest of the United States of America, the rest of the world, should be for their service. Governor Murkowski, you've had this opportunity, this uh, difficult task a as governor. I have a more specific question for you. I've attended some of the memorials you've spoken at, and um, you've offered words of comfort, but also at one memorial, the crowd became visibly upset when you linked the young man's death to uh, the need for America to control its oil supply. Was, was that the wrong place at the wrong time, or did you feel like that was the right message to give? No, I'm not convinced that was the right message to give, but I think it's a message that more Americans should reflect on because this is a war to a large degree that's funded by oil in the Mideast. And the manner in which the cash flow uh, gets to the bad people is from uh, the movement of oil because that's the only cash flow in that part of the world. I've been over to Iraq, I've been over to Afghanistan, I've been over to Pakistan and I understand how terrorism has moved and is exported now to all parts of the world and that's why we're over there to ensure that we won't have to fight uh, a war on terrorism in the United States. But in comforting these families I felt it uh, appropriate to be forthright and honest with them in my belief that more and more Americans should recognize that this kind of a conflict demands a, 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 mid, a Mideast uh, contribution of the countries over there and some are the beneficiaries and some are suffering terribly and that's not uh, the solution we want and it's something we're we're agonizing with in this country. Thank you Governor and on to Michael Carey with another Thank question. Thank you very much Chris. Um, this is a question we'll start with John Binkley. Um, uh, Mr. Binkley if you need good advice to whom do you turn? Who are your top three advisors excluding your spouse? <laughs> my spouse is my most important advisor always have been. Uh, I have a variety of people around the state and this has been one of the great things about the campaign as I travel around Alaska. I've met so many wonderful Alaskans, sharp individuals who really want to contribute, want to serve in Alaska. And those people, I keep a list of them in my pocket and on occasion I call those people around the state of Alaska to get advice because it's not just a group of people in one area, it's people all across the state. We are very distinct in our regions. It's what makes us such a wonderful state. And so I have people from Ketchikan to Barrow to Bethel, uh, Fairbanks, Anchorage, Wasilla, uh, all of, around the state that I rely on for advice. Ms. Palin, 30 seconds. You know, if, uh, to get good advice, you ask the very young and you ask the elderly. That's what I've learned to be so helpful. Two of my mentors, Governor Wally Hickel, who has given such good passionate advice about our Constitution, about the owner's state, and about our resources. He's so helpful. But I think most important and helpful has been Lena Andre, my kid's great-grandmother. She's this wonderful Yupik elder, 80-some years old, from Bristol Bay, who has told me all along in this race, Sarah, we need you to lead because we need Alaskans to work together, to come together in a nonpartisan, pro-Alaska way. We need new leadership. So Lena Andre. And Governor Bukowski, 30 seconds. Well, as governor, I have the benefit of a cabinet. And I'm very proud of my cabinet and the quality of the individuals who serve there because uh, virtually without exception, why well, <coughs> monetarily the rewards would be much higher in the private sector. I've got a couple of members that uh, you know have committed themselves to take a significant personal sacrifice because they feel Alaska has been good to them and they want to make a contribution back. And I have a couple of members that basically serve in responsible positions at no cost to the state of Alaska. These are extraordinary men and women, and I'm very proud of them. Thank you, Governor. Now fasten your seatbelts because now's a chance for the candidates to ask questions to each other. 
Keep your questions as brief as we try to do. You will have, we'll ask a question, and then the respondent has a minute to respond. Then the questioner has 30 seconds to rebut. Ms. Palin, we'll start with you. Whom do you want to address the question? I'd like to ask Mr. Binkley a question about his past experience in politics when being as an advocate for using the permanent fund. Has that position of yours changed after um, uh, starting in the ads to go ahead and use the permanent fund and um, supporting such measures? Has the position changed? Mr. Binkley, one minute. I'm a strong protector of the permanent fund and certainly the permanent fund dividend. Always have been, always will be. Certainly as an elected official, it's a responsibility I feel we uh, have as one of the highest responsibilities. I supported it, had the privilege of voting on the constitutional amendment to establish the permanent fund, and throughout my legislative career have always supported it and will continue to support it. Uh, sometimes as an individual business person, uh, as a member of the Chamber of Commerce and others, uh, they've taken different viewpoints as I think the Association of Mayors and Municipal League, when you were a, port, a part of that, uh, take different viewpoints on that issue as well. But certainly as an elected official, I will always protect the permanent fund dividend and always have. Ms. Palin, 30 second rebuttal. Well, so I am glad and pleased that um, the position there has changed to be a protector now with the permanent fund because as Jay Hammond had pointed out, uh, it's called the permanent fund for a reason. It's not to be used for uh, today's uh, political needs and, and wants, but it is for tomorrow. It is for our future generations. And as I'm raising that next generation of Alaskans, I want to make sure that the fund is there and that wise investments are made and that we can um, utilize that fund for the future. Too often the permanent fund is first on the chopping block and proposals to uh, meet budget it needs, I think it should be last. Governor Murkowski, you have a chance to pose a question to one of the other candidates. John, uh, you know, we all talk about responsibility. You and I have talked about this prior to your announcement as a candidate for governor. And uh, it's the issue associated with Alaska Riverways and the inability of the state to come to grips with a lease. And I, I would question how you can maintain that position that, uh, you know, you don't have an obligation when you're leasing an area over what is state land, in other words, the river, and uh, your uh, uh, recognition that uh, you feel it's wrong yet uh, Alaska River or the uh, Great Northern uh, boat that operates on the river, uh, 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 several other uh, operations pay to the state a modest fee, 25 cents. Uh, a a head tax or a thousand dollars. So the question is, greater. Governor. So the question is an obvious one. Why do you continue to hold out when uh, it's recognizable under under statute, and law, and regulation that this is a legitimate fee structure, and uh, others pay it, and you uh, you continue to? Uh, Mr. Uh, Bickley, you have well, one minute to respond. Well, thank you very much. Of course, we're waiting for the government uh, uh, to respond and to actually do the finding of facts and have the, the finding that's necessary to go forward. We're certainly willing, always have been, to pay our fair share as long as any fees are charged fairly across the state. It's really simply wrong for government to go in and pick off individual businesses with uh, discriminatory taxes or fees. We'll pay our fair share. We always have. We've been a long time business in Alaska. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity, the privilege really, of operating on the rivers throughout Alaska, have for generations, and, and would like to continue to do so. But it's really when the, when the government doesn't have a system that's fair across the board for all users of navigable waterways uh, that we really take exception to. And, and sometimes you really just have to stand up and say it's not right and make certain that the government goes through the right procedure so that it's fair and equitable around the state. Thank you, Mr. Binkley. Governor, you have 30 seconds. Well, John, it's been 27 years in discussion and, uh, you know, there's a, a, a calculation based on the back taxes for about 11,000 and it's, it's beyond me that uh, you would continue to object to what is a legitimate fee because you're using a portion of the of the river uh, for your accommodations and I certainly don't begrudge that to you but I'm a little surprised that you'd go into a, uh, an election with uh, an issue like this hanging out for people to question well why doesn't uh, Alaska Riverways pay when they're one of the biggest users. Thank you, Governor. And, We're uh, hard for time. Pay. Mr. Binkley, you get the last question. What's the question and to whom do well, you want to address it? Thank you. And my question really is to Sarah Palin. Sarah, you've been a, a strong advocate for some time, over a year now really, for the pr proposed LNG route of building a pipeline to Valdez and putting the, the uh, liquefied natural gas in tankers. 
uh, bringing that out of Alaska now into the Canadian system. And, and then recently, just within the last month at a couple of these forums, you've changed your position. It went from solidly in support of the LNG route to being your preferred option and now it's just one of the options you would consider. Why have you made such a dramatic change in such a short period of time in your position on this most important issue to Alaska? Thank you. One minute. I'm afraid you may get the last word because we're running out of time. Yeah, and it is such an important issue, and that's why I've solidly supported consideration of the Alaskan project also, connecting Alaskans with our gas that we own, fueling our homes, our businesses, our economy first, and getting on the world market. I've never said it's got to be all LNG or nothing, so I kind of um, uh, I beg to differ there with your characterization. Um, we need to fairly objectively consider all options. Resources are craving our product here. They're craving our resources. And all entities should have the right to compete for the right to tap our resources. That's how we're going to pick the most viable option, lay them all out on the table. The Alaskan Project, TransCanada, Warren Buffett's Mid-Americans, locally, maybe Doyon, maybe some independents want to bid on this project of building a gas line. Let's put it all out on the table. I would love to see an Alaskan line. I would love to see that. And we are going to build a gas line while I'm governor, and we're going to do that on Alaska's terms, not big oil companies' terms. We won't concede and call that negotiations Alaska's terms. I'm sorry that we're running out of time. <laughs> Now for the closing statements, but with a twist. I will ask a question, and please have your answer be the basis for your closing statement. Mr. Binkley, what have viewers learned tonight that is new about you that should convince them to vote for you? I hope that viewers have learned that I have a depth of experience, a maturity, really, and the ability to lead the state of Alaska. I've had the privilege of starting my own small business. My <laughs> wife and I have uh, been married 29 years. We started a small business together. Uh, we built that business in rural Alaska. We lived in rural Alaska for 11 years. That's unique, really, for an individual who's seeking the office of governor. I've served as chairman of the Alaska Railroad Corporation, a large and complex organization for nine years, led the way for the railroad really to expand and to really take uh, charge in, in helping the economy of the rail belt of Alaska. I've also raised my children. Our children are grown. They're adults, productive Alaskans now, and we're blessed with two grandchildren. So it's the right season, the right time in my life for my wife and I to step forward to serve Alaska as governor and first lady. I look forward to the opportunity, and I ask for your support on Tuesday, August 22nd. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Binkley. Ms. Palin, one minute. Okay. I think that uh, viewers hopefully will have recognized that I am such a proponent of competition and free enterprise in our economy. And I want to remind folks of what we were able to accomplish there in the fastest growing area of the state in the Valley. As I was the mayor there, my team that was put together, a pro-private sector team there, what we were able to do was eliminate personal property taxes and eliminate small business inventory taxes. And each year in office, reduce the real property tax mill levy and reduce and eliminate other fees that were onerous and burdensome to businesses. So that our businesses would know that we were inviting investment into the community. That type of philosophy needs to be shared statewide, a pro-private sector agenda, so that government can concentrate on the basic necessities to provide public safety, infrastructure, and good education. We were able to do that out there in the Valley, and we have wonderful economic indicators of success. So a proponent of free enterprise and competition, it makes us all better. Work harder, reduce costs, it makes us more resourceful, and that's what I'll do as governor. Thank you, Ms. Palin, and Governor Murkowski, one minute. Well, you've heard it before, but you know, Alaskans might ask themselves, are they better off today than they were four years ago? We were looking at an 800 million dollar deficit. We were looking at a balanced budget that was only a dream. Uh, we were making tough cuts. And you needed a tough governor to make the decisions because basically it takes courage, leadership, and experience. And I have that experience. I had it in the 22 years of the Senate, to 22 years on the Energy Committee. I know a lot about energy. But I also know what it takes to bring together a business deal. And we're about to embark on the greatest significant event since statehood, and that's the gas line, because it'll anchor the economy into this state for the next 50 years. And I have the experience to do that. I've brought to the legislature a contract. We've been talking about it in this state for the last 30 years. They have it now. I'm going to bring them back. After the election, we're going to go back to work. We're going to finish the job, because we can't afford to risk 
losing it. It's not at any price. It's the price that's best for Alaska and best for reinvestment. And I think it's fair to say that I'm the only one that can beat, in my opinion, the Democratic candidate, and that's Tony Knowles. And that will remain to be seen. Thank you, Governor, and thank you all the candidates. Well, I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Again, thank you to all the candidates, panelists, audience, and crew. Tomorrow night at 8, we will have the top two Democrats who are vying to be the next governor, Tony Knowles and Eric Croft. Tuesday, August 22nd, is the primary election. Please remember to vote. I'm Christopher Clark. Good night. Primary voters go to the polls Tuesday in Alaska and Wyoming.